right, guys. How's it going? Welcome back to the show. This is your host, Hunter McWaters. It's good to be with you again, as always. And today, I got a really cool episode for you. Um, as some of you may know that have been listening for a while, uh, CrossFit was a big part of my fitness journey. And I know a lot of you guys out there are also into CrossFit. So um, today's guest is one of the original founding members of the first CrossFit gym out in California. Um, he's also known as the original fire breather. Um, his name is Greg Amundsen and he's a really cool guy. He's an author, pastor, an artist, uh, former law enforcement. He was the DEA among other things. He's done SWAT, um, and, uh, obviously very big into fitness. Um, but yeah, um, today we just talk about a lot of stuff, um, including we talk about kind of the theme of a lot of his work, which is kind of the warrior ethos, the warrior mindset, um, and what that means for, for modern men and, um, and Christian men. But even if you're not into, you know, fitness or spirituality necessarily, this is a really interesting conversation that we have together, um, with one of the original founding members of CrossFit, uh, Greg Amundsen. So it's a great episode. I really hope you enjoy it. Um, the verse that I kind of came to, to go along with today's episode, I think it really fit Greg just because of his whole warrior mindset that he embodies, um, is, uh, Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. Um, well, actually I'll start in 10. So it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me um, in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that was actually Ephesians six ten through 20, which is a lot more than I was planning to read, but uh, it's so good. I just had to keep going. So that's the Apostle Paul talking, and he's talking about um, preparing yourself for war spiritually. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really apropos to the conversation we have today. Um, and I think you guys will get a lot out of it. So definitely stick around and check it out. Um, and um, also, uh, you know, I like to send out swag to folks that leave me reviews on Apple Podcasts. So um, this week, Lydia from Wisconsin, uh, if you're out there, go ahead and shoot me a DM with your address and I'll get some decals in the mail for you. Appreciate that review. Um, also excited. I'm almost done with the video series of my Kodiak trip from last year. It's going to be a three part series. And um I finished all three rough cuts. I'm just in the final editing stages and getting color done and whatnot. So I'm excited to release those out uh, soon. Um, I'm leaving for Arizona in four days from when I'm recording this. So they will not release before that. But um, late January, possibly early February, I'm going to drop those. So please, if you have not yet, go to YouTube, search my name, Hunter McWaters, and subscribe to the channel. And uh, if you're listening to this, I appreciate your support. Please support me. Continue to support me by going over there and watching those YouTube videos and subscribing to my YouTube channel. Um, It's it's really big and we've got a lot of cool stuff planned for more video content in 2022, which I'll tell you guys more about. But um, for now, just go ahead and enjoy this episode and please share with friends and family because it's a good one.
All right, so I am here with my guest who I'm really excited to talk about, or talk with, excuse me, um, <laughs> a guy that, uh, yeah, he's an inspiration to a lot of folks, and uh, yeah, just the conversation I've been looking forward to, so I'm here with Greg Amundsen. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, man. i um, really glad to have you. We had to reschedule a couple of times just because our my schedule and your schedule, and um, before we jump in, I'd, I'd love to hear about just kind of what you've been up to recently. So one of the reasons we had to kind of push it back was, uh, you were training a fighter. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I was in, Tell about that. yeah, I was in Las Vegas, Nevada for about a month. I was there most of the month of August, helping a dear friend of mine, fellow Christian brother named Robert, the ghost Guerrero. He was preparing for a 10 round fight against Victor vicious Ortiz. Ooh. He was the co-main event for the Monty Pacquiao oh, okay. event fight. So just a tremendous opportunity for Robert. So I really cleared my schedule to devote all my time, all my energy to helping prepare Robert for that fight in which he was victorious. <laughs> nice. So it was just an awesome, awesome experience. What a blessing. Nice. Have you trained fighters before or is that a first? I've trained many fighters. That okay. was my fourth time working with Robert. I work with other fighting modalities as well. Although yeah. it seems to be the boxers that I really gravitate towards. They gravitate towards me. Okay. Have you done any American boxing in your career yourself? No. Or? no, I have a martial arts background. But when Robert first contacted me, that was my first exposure to the sport of boxing. Okay. What's, what, what martial arts have you had experience with? I'm a black belt in Krav Maga. Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I've been thinking about getting back into martial arts. I did it as a kid. Um, I know a lot of guys, you know, talk about BJJ. A lot of the guys have recommended that to me, but you like Krav Maga, huh? Given my background in military law enforcement, Krav Maga was the most practical, efficient, job transferable gotcha. fighting system. Now, that being said, I'm also a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Okay. Krav Maga adopts a lot of the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu ground fighting principles for their system. So Jiu Jitsu is a fantastic system. A lot of the athletes that train at my gym in Santa Cruz are high level Jiu Jitsu fighters. So it's a fantastic way to defend oneself. Cool. Um, and just last thing on here, did was there any like, you know, specific things that you learned from tr doing this training with this fighter or that God's been teaching you just lately through this process or anything like that? Oh, so much, brother. You know, every every morning Robert and I woke up, we started our day with Bible study. Nice. Diving into God's word. What we found is that there's this interesting balance between faith and work. Where once we've settled the issue of our salvation, which is a free gift of God's grace, nothing that we can do to earn that. Right. We don't deserve that. Free gift of God's grace. Yeah. There's another type of faith, though, that's at work in the life of a believer once our eternal salvation has been settled. Mm. There's this faith in what God can continue to do in our life. We participate in that faith. So it's this neat balance that Robert and I were fighting with, so to speak, yeah. or boxing with. Because on one hand, there's some things that we cannot do apart from God's supernatural intervention in our life. Yet even those things that God intercedes for us on our behalf require some degree of contribution on our part. Absolutely. So it's learning where I need to apply effort, where I need to surrender my effort. Yeah. That's what Robert and I were really up to those 30 days, was learning what Robert is responsible for in this equation, what I'm responsible for, what's ultimately in God's hands. Yeah. So we can focus on what God wants us to do, then we can leave what God wants to do entirely in his hands. Nice, man. Such a cool balance and such a interesting thing to think about. I'm sure you had some a book of James in there probably going. Yeah, James, um, Colossians, I think Paul describes the illustration or the analogy of a seed 
that mm-hmm. sprouting Jesus uses a similar illustration. We plant the seed. Now the growth of the seed is up to God. Right. But it in requires the, watering. Right. In the, in the planting and in, in the, in the attentiveness and the care yeah. to that seed, we have a harvesting, planting, farming responsibility. Absolutely. I love that illustration. And, and like you said, um, it takes spiritual growth, like physical takes discipline and work and effort, but it is, you know, there also are times to rest and re- lean on God. So it's such a cool balance, man. I love that. Yeah. That's actually an illustration I think of often. I go to the CrossFit studio. I exercise. I put my heart into this workout. Then I think to myself, you know, I did a great job in that workout. <laughs> Great job, Greg. <laughs> right, then I then I question my theology. I'm like, okay, so let's look at the qualities that I brought to the table in that workout. So did I bring the quality of perseverance? Absolutely. Where did that come from? Yeah. Did I bring the quality of determination, of willpower, of effort? Well, where did those qualities come from? Well, they came from my father in heaven. Yeah. Nevertheless, once I received the gift. It's so freely given to me. I have a responsibility mm-hmm. to utilize the steward skills to steward those. Yeah. So it's, it's such a great topic. I just, I'm in great. love with this topic. It's such a passionate part of my life these days. Cool, man. Um, well, yeah, before, before we get too much into that stuff, which I want to get back into a little bit, but, um, you know, I want to give you a chance to kind of introduce yourself and give yourself a little, uh, of an introduction to my audience because, um, so, you know, I don't know, you've been on a lot of podcasts, but maybe not one kind of specific to what I'm talking about, but I think my listeners will really resonate with you. Um, the, the podcast is about, you know, hunting and spiritual formation and fitness. And, um, you know, I don't know what your experience or history or knowledge is of, about hunting, but the type of hunting that, that we do is, is very physical, very physically demanding. You know, we hunt in the mountains. We, we carry our gear in with us for multiple days and nights. We carry the animals meat back out with us. Um, so it's something that requires a high level of, um, you know, physical effort and, you know, you gotta be in shape basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, spirituality is something that I like to bring into the, the, topic because there's tons of good podcasts out there about training physically and even mental toughness within this space. Um, but, um, as in a lot of things in our culture, the spiritual side of it, unfortunately was a, an afterthought or maybe a brief mention. So my, my kind of, uh, reason that I wanted to bring this podcast to the table was to add that spiritual element to it. And I think that's something that you integrate so well, but I want to give my listeners who may not have heard you, even though a lot of guys in our community do use CrossFit to get in shape. Um, but I want to hear about you, your story, not only as it relates to CrossFit, but also your professional background in law enforcement and that kind of stuff. Sure. I have been asked within the last year to be on a lot of podcasts. So I've really narrowed my yes to oh, cool. podcasts where I feel that I can make a contribution while honoring my faith. Totally. Which was what was so intriguing about your podcast. <laughs> it was easy yes. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, easy yes. The the question I had at first was, well, how can I speak directly to the audience that hunts because I thought for a moment that I'm not a hunter. I've never killed an animal in my life. Even a fish, the few fish that I caught just by luck, I threw back in the water. Yeah. But then I realized I do hunt for predators Mm. who are endangering the flock that God has entrusted me with. Nice. Whether that flock be the community of Santa Cruz County, where I served as a deputy for many years, whether that be our nation, I served in the U.S. Army, I served as a special agent protecting our borders against the infiltration of terrorism, narcotics. Yeah. I've been hunting in that sense for 20 years. (laughs) Nice. So I do know a thing or two about hunting. Yeah. 
So I hope to be able to speak to your audience. Totally. As a hunter and as a man of God. Yeah. So my background is somewhat varied, although also narrow, in the sense that I started in law enforcement in 1999. I continue that to this very day. It's just that I've worn many uniforms while adhering to the same oath of office. So I served as a local police officer, as a deputy sheriff. In those capacities, I was on a SWAT team. I was an entry team leader. I was a sniper. Mm. Then I transitioned to the federal government. I served as a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration. I'm obviously biased to the DEA. I do yeah. think it's the nation's premier law enforcement agency. Nice. <laughs> Although my brothers in the ATF or FBI would likely argue with me on that. <laughs> While serving with the DEA, I was then recruited to be a liaison to a really aggressive team called the BEST team, Border Enforcement Security Task Force. Mm. This was a run and gun team. That's where I essentially ended my career with DEA. Then I transitioned back to Santa Cruz, where I now live again. Now I serve on a maritime unit. I'm part of the Santa Cruz Harbor Patrol. Oh, cool. So now my experience is still law enforcement, although now we tend to do more water rescue, water operation. Nice. So now I'm still hunting for people who are lost at sea. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Who are fighting the enemy of uh, stormy weather. So I've worn a lot of hats. Um, So I look for variables that have remained consistent throughout over a 20 year career. What I found is that law enforcement is the nexus. I'm, I'm sorry, um, faith is the nexus in this vast law enforcement career. Um, faith and fitness um, are, are what has remained the, the thread. Yeah. So al- although I've worn different uniforms and had different assignments, what, what hasn't changed at all is, is my faith and my, and my dedication to a robust physical fitness program that's been CrossFit. For, for just over 20 years now. I, w- I was blessed to have been at the right place at the right time. CrossFit started in Santa Cruz. Yeah. I started with CrossFit before there was even CrossFit.com. Oh, wow. So before the website even launched, I, I've been blessed with an opportunity to have been mentored by a gentleman named Coach Greg Glassman, who was the founder of CrossFit. Oh, yeah. So he took me under his wing, mentored me for approximately two or three years before the program really caught the attention of the public safety military community. And when it did, again, I was at the right place at the right time to help be an ambassador for the program to that community where faith was, you can see where my emphasis is, faith, uh, fitness was was really the the difference between life and death. Yeah. Um, how, How interesting, right, that I just, I was going to say, well, what I meant to say is what I corrected myself to say. Right? <laughs> yeah. Fitness was the difference. But notice what I said. Faith. Mm. Right? I was I, I was I was unintentionally through through the power of the spirit going to say faith was the difference between life and death. How interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, so so it, it, I, I it's kind of like, wow, who who am I to correct myself and say no, it's fitness. <laughs> right? Cuz what I what I've been doing quite frankly for the past several years is playing catch up. Mm. because for so long what i was doing is i was i was aggressively traveling around the country telling people to do crossfit because i believed wholeheartedly it was a life-saving fitness program i still do i just taught a course for bakersfield police department their swat team here in california Mm -hmm. very very proactive excellent swat team some very fit operators i taught a course eight hour course on crossfit Yet what I'm doing differently these days is I'm simultaneously integrating faith. Nice. Because what I've realized is that you can have all the fitness in the world and and still still fail in 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 every conceivable way that one could fail. Hmm. You can fail in a marriage, you can fail in a profession, you can fail in in your, your overall health. Um, you can fail in your purpose, your mission. Yeah. Most importantly, you, you can fail in the one relationship that matters most, and that is your relationship with God. Yeah. Right. So, so adding five more pounds to my deadlift, adding one more pull up to my max set of pull ups does nothing for my relationship with God. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, 
so I, I, I had to really, um, I, I, I was convicted, uh, really, that's, that's the best term for those people that are familiar with the implications of the Holy Spirit convicting us. Mm. I was convicted because here I am uh, um, distorting the Great Commission, mm. right? The Great Commission was not go, go make CrossFit disciples <laughs> of the world. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what I was doing. Uh, but God knew my heart. Like I, I was doing that because I really wanted my brothers and sisters in law enforcement to be safe. Yeah. And I saw how CrossFit was, was affecting my life, how it was making me safer. I saw how it was making those people that I was teaching safer. Mm. So my heart was in the right place, but I was convicted because what I felt God challenging me to do was, hey, Greg, can you go out into the world with the same enthusiasm, this, this same um, almost recklessness that you do? Um, you, you, you surrender everything for CrossFit. You, know, you travel on your own dime. Yeah. Across, you do that for me. Mm. Um, and when I started to do that, um, doors began to open. Lives began to be changed in ways that were clearly beyond what I had anticipated and beyond what I was doing on my own. Yeah. God was clearly at work through me. Um, and so that, that's kind of what, that's kind of what I'm up to these days. Like if you, if you look at my own, um, platforms, whether it be my podcast, my teaching, my mm -hmm. books, that's kind of what I'm up to is I'm trying to now integrate faith and fitness in a, in a cohesive, unified way. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good, man. There's so much in there that to unpack. Um, and, and one thing I was thinking about when I was preparing for this, first of all, you know, you talked about relating to my audience and, um, and you talk a lot about the warrior archetype and that's something that you identify with. And that's why, um, perhaps you went into law enforcement. Um, and I feel like, um, hunters, especially the style of hunting we do are also in many cases fitting into that warrior archetype because we desire, like, you know, not who other people would, you know, take their vacation and go to the mountains for a week and suffer, you know, with guns. <laughs> it's yeah. like these warrior archetype type guys. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, in traditional cultures, um, the hunters and the warriors were many times one and the same. But mm -hmm. one thing that that I thought about was if you look at all the great warrior cultures throughout history, whether it's Native Americans or samurai or um, I don't know, name anyone you want, there was always a strong spiritual element and mm -hmm. i feel like in our culture we have removed that from the, many of our warriors you know um so that's what i love about your message is is uh incorporating that so i guess you know how would you define the warrior archetype and then why is it so important to integrate that into a full warrior person Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I just wrote a book on this. So my <laughs> my new book, newest book, is called Warrior. Nice. <laughs> the subtitle is The Way of a Warrior of Light. So this is a way of unifying the warrior ethos, the warrior archetype, so that everyone can be a warrior. When we look at the warrior archetype through this unique path or methodology of discipleship, yeah. So I define warrior as self-mastery mm. in service of others. So two sides to the same coin. So the way I unpack this in the introduction to my book is really through an illustration Jesus uses. Jesus describes people as trees. Mm -hmm. Then he talks about different types of fruit that a tree can produce. The fruit is either good or bad. So in this sense, the fruit that a tree produces is entirely dependent on the type of tree. Mm. So if I want to produce different fruit, I need to plant a different tree. Mm. Now, this is a complete antithesis or a, a completely divergent path from what the world tries to convince us of. So the world would try to convince us that if we want to change something in our life, 
we focus on the fruit. Right. So new car, new house, new mm. wardrobe, new job, new spouse, right? Mm. Something out there right. in the fruit needs to change. And this is what most people do. And I'm sure some listeners are going to relate to this right away. Like yeah. we've all tried this, right? I've tried this, right? I'm going to get a new this and then I, everything's going to change. Yeah. Like, you know, this, this sensation that the chemical hormonal um, enthusiasm of that experience lasts for a little bit. Then what happens? Oh man, nothing's changed. So what do I do? I buy something else or right. I change something else. I, I, I still focus on the fruit. And, and that, that is, is um, kind of insanity, right? If we if we continue to do that, um, and what Jesus reveals to us is that there is a way to change the fruit, but it's not by trying to change the fruit. It's by it's by allowing the Spirit of God to to uproot you mm-hmm. and to to relocate you and to replant you in His soil. So so you 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 become an entirely new tree, and then naturally as as a byproduct of the new tree. The new spirit within you, yeah. you produce new fruit. Totally. Um, and so, and so that kind of speaks to this idea of self mastery. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's this it's this cooperation with the spirit of God. Um, it's it's this process of uh, to use theological language like regeneration, sanctification. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the warrior ethos, we would describe that as a season of self mastery. Um, and, and we see this in the life of David, for example, who's, who's a great warrior hunter, mm-hmm. right? We see this. What happens after David's anointing? Well, there's a season, uh, right. of, a, a potentially very long season of self-mastery. He goes back to the shepherd's field. Yeah. It's during that season that he hunts. Mm-hmm. He kills the lion, the bear, when they try to threaten his flock. Right. That season of self-mastery, um, thriving on God's spirit, developing his faith that allows him to come on the scene to defeat Goliath. Yeah. And developing that confidence. Say, I beat the I beat the lion, I beat the bear, I'll beat this Philistine. Exactly. exactly. So so this naturally leads us to the second side of the coin, right? So on one side of the coin is self-mastery. We turn that coin over on the other side of the coin is in service of other people. Hmm. Yeah. So they, they're, they're complementary. The, the degree that we master ourselves, that self mastery is put into service, not for ourselves, for other people. So we see that exemplified in the life of David. David arrives on scene after a season of self mastery to serve God, to serve others using that season of self-mastery to overcome Goliath. Yeah. So David's victory, in fact, became a victory for the people of God. Yeah. They won the victory without having to do anything at all. They mm-hmm. didn't lift a finger in yeah. that fight. So that's the that's this uh that's this archetype that I that I just love to unpack. And what we see is it's it's woven throughout scripture. Hmm. You know, it's an underlining theme throughout all scripture. Sadly, it doesn't seem to be proclaimed or, or preached on um, as much as I as that much as much as I would would like to see. It, 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 I, I think we're doing a disservice, especially to the law enforcement military community, especially to the community that you're serving, people who are intrinsically drawn toward towards hunting towards the warrior ethos. Yeah. It's encouraging to know that no, no, no. Um, God loves his warriors. Yeah. Right. God specifically, God, God could have used any archetype he wanted. Right. But what did he, what, what did he use over and over again? This, this warrior fighting, yeah. triumphant, overcoming battle archetype. Right. Even the shepherd uh, character really fits into that. In, in like, as we we're saying with David and how Jesus uses the shepherd imagery constantly, um, not, they didn't just sit there and count sheep. Like, like just like David, that they had to smash a bear with their staff. I mean, they had to protect the flock as a big part of it. Yeah, it's interesting too. You know, the word. Um, uh, so in in currently, what our country is experiencing um, is tragic in the law enforcement community. The word warrior is being extracted, being mm. removed. Mm. In place of the word warrior, the word guardian is being inserted. 
So when I started my career in law enforcement, warrior was a term of endearment that was instilled into recruits during the academy, hmm. further instilled during the developmental years of our career. We were told that we were warriors, right. that we had to protect the community by going after those people who were intent on harming the innocent, harming mm. the weak, go after them, find them, apprehend them, bring them to justice. Then, for reasons I can't quite comprehend, that word was deemed inappropriate. Hmm. So the word guardian replaced the word warrior. Now, it's not that I have anything against the word guardian. It's just that the implications or the trajectory of the warrior as opposed to the guardian, there's one critical difference. Warriors are inherently guardians. Right. Guardians are not inherently warriors. Mm, mm -hmm. So the difference is that, take David, for example. David, with his flock, as a shepherd, he is aware of his surroundings. He becomes aware that there is a lion or a bear, a predatory animal who is stalking the flock, right. waiting for the opportune time to attack. That time would likely be night when both the shepherd, in addition to the flock, are most vulnerable. Sure. Mm -hmm. So what does David do? He goes after the predatory animal <laughs> yeah. when, during the day when David can see. He hunts. That's a great point. So a guardian. Taking the fight to the enemy. Yes, yes. A guardian would wait. Hmm. Now a guardian, when the attack came, would protect the flock. In that sense, they would fight. Perhaps even in loss of their life, they would surrender their life to guard the flock. Yet by then it might be too late. Mm -hmm. So that's the key difference is that the guardian is willing to protect, willing to serve once the enemy has revealed themselves. Yeah. Once the 911 call has come out, the guardian will respond. Mm. The warrior is doing everything they can to preemptively intercept that predator so that the 911 call never needs to go out. Yeah, that's so good, man. You're it, it made me even think about you're talking about, you know, bringing the fight to the enemy and even like in our just day to day spiritual lives. It's like not getting complacent, right? Like instead of just waiting for uh, the enemy to make that next attack or waiting for that next temptation or that next tribulation and then digging into the Bible and then praying. It's like being proactive by, uh, you know, keeping your spiritual disciplines up, like um, being living ready so that um, it's it's almost in a way, even though you're kind of living ready and building up your defenses, you're also taking the fight to the enemy in a way by like mm -hmm. just staying after it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, all we have to do is look through some of Paul's epistles to see that, again, if we hold that the scripture is inspired, the inspired word of God, mm -hmm. then we know that the author behind the human hand that wrote the scripture, the author could have used any illustration that he wanted to. Yeah. Yet what illustration does Paul use time and time again? The soldier. The soldier, the warrior, right? Put on the full Armor, armor of God. Yeah. Then Paul unpacks with great attention to detail the specific pieces of armor, including mm -hmm. a very offensive weapon, the short sword used mm -hmm. for close quarters battle. So to overlook the implications of the warrior archetype in the Christian walk mm -hmm. is a great disservice. Great disservice. We've got to embrace that quality within us god made his children to be warriors absolutely yet the warrior that will not happen by accident you don't just stumble into that identity right. 
Right. That has to be cultivated, just like anything that God calls us to do. This is, again, coming back to where we started our conversation, this, this interplay between God's invitation, the opportunity that God gives us to develop ourselves, then our contribution to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, you know, leads kind of a, to my next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, like you said, it takes cultivation, just like, you know, something I talk about a lot is we are triune beings, right? We're almost like mini trinities in ourselves, you know, spirit, soul, and body. Mm. In fact, that's, that's the way, that's the best illustration for the Trinity. I really have thought about is like us, we are mm -hmm. spirit, soul, and body. But anyway, um, and we have to cultivate all three of those or something will be out of whack, you know? Um, and there's so many great tie-ins between physical uh, fitness and spiritual fitness. Um, but I'm just curious from your perspective, like how do you specifically, Greg Amundsen, how do you cultivate uh, this, this triune warrior? Like how do you stay fit physically, mentally, and spiritually on a daily basis? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in a very practical sense yeah that that is that's the question that most people seek me out for in my mentorship <laughs> program is that yeah. very matter of fact i had a coaching call earlier this morning that was the question burning on on my friend's heart he wanted that he wanted the answer to that question and you know what i'm up to these days i i, I the way i've answered that question over the years has changed sure so what I'm up to these days is I'm really trying to point to Jesus because what I see the world doing is saying, look at me, mm -hmm. listen to me. Um, I don't spend too much time on social media. Usually I use a social media platform for one-way communication. Right. Um, Yet from time to time, I'll look at what some of my more secular friends are up to. I've noticed this remarkable trend. People on their social media, mainly Instagram, are quoting themselves. Yeah. They'll even put their own name. I hate yeah. that. I hate that. I, think it's, I love it. I think it's hysterical. It People funny. are quoting. Them. So what do they do? Do they yeah. do they just do they think of something crafty in their mind and then <laughs> say it, then write it down? Because they have to quote themselves. Yeah. That, would, that would imply they've spoken it to themselves. That yeah. down that it just it cracks it's so me funny. Up. It's so funny. Right. But then the other thing we see is that um, very often the the photograph of choice on the social media platform is a selfie. Right. The camera is using the reverse feature then held in front of one's face to take a photograph mm -hmm. so in other words what the post is doing is saying listen to me look at me which is the complete opposite of what we're called to do yeah right totally. speak lord your servant is listening. Mm. Let us cast our gaze onto the Lord. So we're called not to speak, right? When given the opportunity, Samuel did not say, God, your servant is speaking. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> yeah. Right? When given the opportunity, Samuel modeling for us says speak lord your servant is listening yeah and we're told to look at jesus the author the perfecter of our faith mm -hmm. let us cast our gaze onto the lord so i'm i'm saying this because when i'm asked these questions i really want to honor the question i don't want to dismiss the question i'm just trying to do it in a way that i'm not I contradicting myself you know i want to have integrity i understand right so many of my friends who are in the space of self-mastery what they're up to these days is creating daily planners mm -hmm. that allocate time 
checklists. Right. Very sophisticated platforms. There's apps that do this. Then we think about Jesus. A, a, a man who, who changed history to the degree that we are in the year 2021 around the world. The whole world is in 2021 mm -hmm. AD, right? After Interestingly, the, death, the country of Iran does not recognize that. They're like in 13 <laughs> something because my wife is Iranian and they don't wow, go by that. Wow. But anyway, but yeah, you're right. Uh, crazy, crazy. Um, well, for, you know, nine out of 10 countries, <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> Nine no, I get out of you. 10 people in the world are uh, are in the year 2021. Right. Yeah. Um, how remarkable, right? That that this man, um, whether we want to look at him as a historical figure, like many people do, mm -hmm. or whether, much like you and I and Christians do, to to see him as as um, God the Son incarnate. Um, however, we we look at Jesus, we have to concede that this man changed the world. Absolutely. So how does a man like that live? He must have had some remarkable um, to-do list, right? He must have had some, some schedule that we can model. Right. Um, but what we realize is that, no, quite, quite the contrary. He, he lived a life of, of um, extraordinary sensitivity hmm. to the Spirit of God dwelling within him that was guiding him. Right, even in his prayer, give us this day. In other yeah. words, God, lead me today. Mm -hmm. If we look at the 23rd Psalm, um, the, the Lord is my shepherd, which implies that, that I'm being led um, by a shepherd um, who, who is within extraordinary proximity to me because his rod, his staff guides me. So that's an interesting metaphor, right? The, the rod and staff are not the same thing. The staff was a singular long piece of wood that would be used to prod or to advance the flock. Mm -hmm. The rod had a shepherd's nook on it that would be used to, to reach out, to draw back in hmm. an animal that had, that had begun to wander off. In either case, the proximity of my shepherd to me is very close. Yeah. So I can see him. I can hear him. So what this implies is that it's not my will, but the Lord's will be done in my life. So if, we, if, if we're investigating and, and looking at the life of Jesus, the only consistent habit, you know, a spiritual discipline of our Lord's life that I've been able to detect is that our, our Lord had the habit of getting up early mm -hmm. while it was still dark to go away to secluded places to pray. Yeah. So on the one hand, I do believe that we should read this in a hermeneutic that is historical contextual. So on one hand, that really happened. Jesus really did get up. Now, his disciples must have seen this. So perhaps it was Mark that saw Jesus get up early. And Mark is, he's, he's tired. He, he doesn't want to get up, but he sees Jesus getting up. And, and he, he knows Jesus is going off to pray. And then Mark goes off to bed and, you know, he wakes up a few hours later. Jesus has returned. Yeah. And Mark knows that Jesus got up early to pray. On the other hand, I think we can also read this spiritually or allegorically. And I think that what we have to do on one hand is, is to remove ourselves from the distractions of our daily life, to get away from the crowds, to go pray. Mm. Jesus said as much, when you pray, go into the closet, close the door, pray to your father in secret. Right. But also we could go into the closet in secret and bring all the distractions of the world in our mind with us. Sure. So I think, or a cell Jesus, phone. you know, I think he also had the, the spiritual discipline of just clearing his mind hmm. of, of, of being present with his father to listen to what God wanted him to do. 
right? Completely surrendered to the will of the Father. Yeah. And that's the only spiritual discipline that we see in our Lord's life. So if, if Jesus had a to-do list, that was it. That's what, that's what, that was the number one check mark on his to-do list. Yeah. And everything else flowed naturally, spontaneously. He was at the right place at the right time to perform the miraculous life that he performed. Yeah. Um, there, there, there was no application that he was using. There was no formula. There was no catchy, um, uh, you know, 80, 20 rule, uh, you know, no, none of that. Right. The one thing, no, no, no. Um, but, but the problem with that is that, is that that's not going to sell. Right. You know, that's not going to sell an, a new subscription. Yeah. Um, because the problem with that is that that doesn't say on it, look at me, listen to me. Mm. That says, look at Jesus, listen to Jesus. Yeah. And, and so many people are reluctant to, to do that very thing, you know, to check the ego and, and to be willing to say, it's not about me. It never was, never will be. Yeah. That's so hard for people, especially the type A personality, quite frankly, especially warriors. Yeah. Right. But so on, on one hand, I, I, I would think that, that when, 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 when someone predisposed to the warrior archetype looks at Jesus, looks at the totality of scripture, realizes that Jesus is the fulfillment. He's the greater David. Mm -hmm. He's the greater Joshua. He's the greater Gideon. He's the ultimate warrior that those predisposed to the warrior archetype would, would be all in. Yet I also know that it's the warrior who, who might be most reluctant. Yeah. And interesting. Yeah. There's always that. It goes back to our original conversation. There's that drive. Like I must do something. I must do something. Not necessarily like I must listen and let God do something through me. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, first of all, to your first point, uh, you know, I think you do a great job. I just a little bit of encouragement here, brother. Like, I think you do a great job of pointing people to Jesus because every podcast I hear you on, even if it's a totally secular one, like sometimes the first thing that comes out of your mind is like, well, Jesus said in the Bible. It's a, so I love that, man. I love your boldness and, and your faith. It's awesome. And, um, and just what you're saying about what Jesus too, like how he lived his life and then things flowed out of that. It's kind of like what you were saying earlier about um, changing your tree and then the fruit is yielded from that. And if you mm -hmm. seek first the kingdom of God, really mm -hmm. the fruit will come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's so good, man. I love that. Yeah. Then, so, you know, that was a very, um, thank you for your patience in my answer to what was probably a very simple question. <laughs> um, I still would love to hear the practical stuff, though. Yeah, that's that, that's what four years of seminary will do to you. <laughs> Once they go into law school. Um, oh, man. I think that objectively speaking, though, you, you just you, you nailed it, brother. Right. Because seek first the kingdom of God, then everything else will be added to you. So when we when we're when we're when we're really seeking God first in our life, then everything we do can be a continuation of that seeking. So I can seek God in a workout. Mm -hmm. I can seek God in the process of writing a book. I can seek God now with you, having an opportunity to speak to you to your audience. Foreseeably, we can seek God. In everything that we do yeah the beautiful thing about seeking god in everything that we do is that when we're surrendered to the spirit we will be convicted very quickly if yeah. we're seeking something that is not in alignment with god's will for our life mm. we'll know right away if what i am doing or seeking or putting my effort into if this is not of god sure He will let us know in a variety of ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He will redirect sure, our steps. Sure, it, it's so it's so cool because it really relates to. I can relate it back to a hunting story. Uh, recently, I just got back a week ago from Kodiak Island, Alaska. Mm. And I was out there in a blacktail deer hunt, um, very physically demanding, and I was also uh, I'm filming everything for YouTube. So, um, you know, I have kind of this 
a little bit of pressure, you know, I want to fill my tag because it's an expensive trip. I want to get my deer, you know, um, I want to get everything on camera. I have all these goals and stuff. And to make a long story short, um, we had some bad weather um, and it looked like it had been days. We hadn't seen anything and it looked like we were going to be leaving again or leaving, you know, Alaska again for me, uh, having not, not fulfilled the goal, which was to, you know, take this animal. And, um, you know, I was kind of discouraged. My wife sent me an inReach message. It's a GPS, I mean, a satellite communication device and said, don't focus on the deer, just focus on God. Uh And, uh, you know, it'll work out. And I had this kind of transformative moment where I'm like, I just need to enjoy this experience. I need to have some alone time with God. You know, I, I went back and hit one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 37, you know, delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. And just started to try to enjoy the trip, enjoy God, enjoy the experience. And then the last morning, weather cleared. Me and my buddy shot two deer within 30 seconds of each other, and it was an amazing trip. So it was just cool how it relates back to everything, you know? Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, man, I got to have you out on a hunting trip sometime. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I'm 43. I've gone 43 years um, without without having – killed an animal <laughs> I don't, I don't I, i'd be happy to accompany you but i, I don't think i'm going to start now <laughs> <laughs> that's all right man it's yeah, it's not for everybody yeah. um one thing i did want to ask you about um got a little bit more time here um i've noticed in my life in my spiritual journey um ebbs and flows you know and much like you could maybe relate it to physical fitness even too of you know um, growth periods and rest periods Um, and while they don't completely relate, um, you know, I feel like a lot of people perhaps, and definitely myself, I've noticed in my life, you know, I'll have periods of, uh, you know, like what's it called? Exponential spiritual growth. And then sometimes you have these periods where like some people call it like a desert or a dry period or whatever. It's just like those, those times when maybe you're not growing as much or you're not feeling as close to the spirit of God. And there's all different theological explanations for those, but, um, something came to my mind last time, which was do when we re when we get to those times when the exponential growth is not necessarily happening, is that the time to kind of, um, view that as a spiritual rest period and maybe just not worry about it? Or is that the time to like dig into the spiritual disciplines, double down and just like, kind of do the work, even though maybe you don't feel like it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just wanted your opinion on that. It's a great question. Um, Something that my seminary theological training has developed within me is the attempt to see through questions to the underlining concern. Hmm. So what's interesting is that what you just described is more in alignment with a Buddhist worldview or Hmm. theological understanding. So the idea of doing something to develop or increase my intimacy or awareness of God's presence. That is not a biblically substantiated position to take or Mm -hmm. idea to entertain. That comes more from an Eastern worldview, Buddhism, Taoism, generally speaking, a yogic philosophical attempt at developing spirituality. Hmm. But so you don't think that, um, like, we can develop our spiritual growth by study and that kind of stuff or prayer or meditation? Well, we want to be careful here. It's a fascinating topic. Um, I was on the Faith RX podcast. 
Oh, cool. I've spoken at one of their events before. Ah, okay. So wonderful platform. FaithRx is a great platform, great community within the larger CrossFit function. Sure, yeah. So I was on this podcast, the host asked me a very similar question. Within just a few minutes, the conversation, if we were to substitute words such as Bible study, meditation, contemplation, prayer, if we would have substituted those words for deadlift, pull up, squat, rope climb, it would have been impossible to differentiate between the effort that we were applying to our faith or our fitness. Hmm. What we've done in that sense is we've completely removed grace from the equation. So we want to be really careful about this idea of taking our faith into our own hands. Look at me. Look at the faith that I look at how spiritual I am. Mm -hmm. We want to be careful of the warning that Jesus so strongly emphasized to his disciples. Be careful. Be wary of that one standing over there in the synagogue. Look at me as I proclaim my faith. Listen to me as I pray. Yeah. We want to be mindful that that is a very, very strong temptation that can lead us completely away from the grace of God. It's a very philosophical worldview. It just doesn't have a lot of standing. Now, I say that, but then I'm also quick to remember that here we see Jesus who prayed. So we see Jesus had the spiritual discipline of prayer. We see Jesus who went away. He removed himself. So the spiritual discipline of solitude. Mm -hmm. We could include in that the spiritual discipline of silence. He's removed from the crowd. Well, clearly there was silence. There was solitude. There was prayer. So certainly there's a place for these spiritual disciplines in our life. It's just that the spiritual discipline is never a substitution for the awareness that God can work supernaturally in my life through his spirit. The same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is at work within me Hmm. apart from anything that I do. So it sounds like you could be maybe saying that kind of going back to a a thought that I was wrestling with and thought initially could be from God, but I wasn't sure. So I'm glad I asked you your opinion on that. It could be that um, just like with, uh, you know, physical strength gains, we have times of growth and then times of like spiritual rest where we're not growing, but we're just kind of, I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. Resting, recovering. Then we would need to ask ourselves, what is the measurement of my spiritual growth? How am I quantifying hmm. something that is supernatural? Yeah. So again, this is why I do on one hand love the integration of faith and fitness. I have a book called Pull Ups in Paradise that uses the context of CrossFit to teach theology. So throughout the book, I'm using illustrations or I'm building bridges Mm -hmm. between faith to fitness. Yet at the same time, we have to understand that the way that we relate to fitness in particular, CrossFit fitness is measurable, repeatable data yeah that's very objective that's tangible measurements right of something that is wildly important in the world yet not something i'm going to take with me into eternity right so isn't it interesting how that still influences the way i think about god Mm mm-hmm where it's such a natural way for me to categorize 
chart, graph. Um, I'm, I'm so naturally inclined to think that way about my fitness that I tend to think that way about my faith. Yeah. And we, I, I think we, um, we just want to be aware that what we're trying to graph or quantify was not meant by to God. To be quantified. To be quantified or, or yeah. measured. Then you become pharisaical, like you were saying. Yeah, how, how, how on earth can you, can you quantify a God who's infinite, yeah. who's omnipresent? You just can't do it. Um, so, so instead, what I, what I should be looking for um, is, is what Paul encourages the believer to look for in Galatians chapter 5. Are we seeing the fruit of the Spirit? Hmm. Am I noticing in my life that, that I'm, I'm a more loving person? Am I, am, am I kinder? Am I more patient? Am I, am I encouraging other people? Am I, am I surrendered to God's will? Am I, am I a man or woman of integrity? Do I, do I, do I have um, fidelity? You know, mm. are, are these qualities, are, are these fruits of the spirit being developed in my life? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and so on, on one hand, we, we do sense the answer, right? I mean, Paul went encourage our awareness of this growth if there wasn't a way that we can see the growth in our life and that we can witness it in the lives of other people um but the way that you would um assess or determine um the 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 fruit is is different yeah it's a different measurement right we For sure. we taste fruit right yeah. um Fruit provides us with with um, nourishment. It sustains us. Fruit can be shared. Right. Um, that that's entirely different ways of, of quantifying and and relating yeah. to something rather than one more pull up or right. five pounds on a deadlift or ten seconds faster on my run. Yeah. Um, you can't put a fruit. numeric value on the taste of a fruit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but that's nevertheless, so good. you can taste it. Right. <laughs> it's measurable, but you, different in a different way. You, you, you know when fruit is you, you know when fruit is ripening and yeah. you know if it's stale <laughs> um, so you, you know these things um, but you know them in a different way yeah see that yeah so I'm really uh, glad I asked you about that because to be honest that's um, not the answer I really expected from you and <laughs> you know I think I've been guilty honestly of um, really glad you challenged me on that because I think I've been guilty lately of um, drawing too many parallels between physical fitness and spiritual fitness, to be honest with you. So I'm really glad for that, for your perspective on that. And, uh, I'm glad you, I'm glad you shared that with me. Um, so, uh, I know you're a busy guy and I appreciate your time. So, um, we, we're coming up on an hour here, so I want to respect that. Um, but I, I would love you to just share, uh, if you have any final thoughts, but then also, you know, where can folks find you if they want to hear more about your books or your podcast and stuff like that? I appreciate it. Um, I'd say, um, I tend to, to kind of use the social media platform, Instagram yeah. more, more for one way communication. So I'm not very good at engaging with other people, but I do use that to, to share, um, um, my books, my content, links to my podcast, things of that nature. So that's Gregory Amundsen on Instagram. Then GregoryAmundsen.com is my website. Cool. So from my website, I'm fairly certain if it's up to date, people can link to my books, my podcast, my art, what I'm cool. up to. Yeah. Yeah. Also an amazing artist, which we didn't mention, but thank you. Yeah, man. Um, well, thanks again for your time, man. This has been a really awesome conversation. Um, you know, tons of stuff I'd love to talk more about, but um, maybe maybe another time. You got it, brother. Thank you, Hunter, for having me on the show, man. God bless yeah. you and God bless all your listeners. Thanks, brother. I'll talk to you soon.